first of all, I would like to uh, thank the organizers uh, for putting this meeting together and also Ray for actually being a part of the oral program. It's great to be here. And uh, I thought I decided to, to talk to show you first about <laughs> Utrecht, and I guess you all know that Utrecht has been very active in terms of Instruct, especially your opponents you see in the audience. And together with uh, Tassos Berakis, uh, we have also been uh, coordinating INEX, which is another, I think, uh, a very nice demonstration of the complementarity of techniques. So if there are specific questions about these aspects, I would say please talk to Rolf and uh, Tassos, and I'll talk a little bit more about what uh, we can do in, N in NMR, and what the kind of technologies that we want to develop in Utrecht to actually integrate in the spirit of what uh, was said in the beginning of this session. And um, I decided to, uh, because I don't want to bore you too much with NMR, I was actually showing you some examples where we actually use or develop NMR to, to make you know, contributions to, to relatively complex systems. And we've already heard about material preparations in the context of tomography. So I'll show you some examples where we use NMR to look at bacterial and protein complexes uh, in the outer membrane of bacteria. And then more recently, we also have been interested in pushing this to mammalian cell lines. So I'll show you. The second part, a little bit about our efforts to look at cancer cells and activation of cancer cells by a combination of, in this case, NMI microscopy techniques, uh, by microscopy techniques. And at the end, I want to share with you some, some recent results we had where we looked at microtubules. And uh, there's some, also some questions for the experts. I already talked to Tassos about this, but I'll come back to that at the end, Tassos. We'll see what you can say about that. So, this is basically the plan that I want to cover in the next 20 minutes. Yeah, so, so coming back to what we just heard in the last talk, uh, the, the material, and this is the congruent negative bacteria, you have a quite a complex situation if you want to study a protein in the uh, outer membrane or in the bacterial cell envelope. And uh, that was nicely put into a cartoon uh, a couple of years ago in the Biophysical Journal, where you just look at an outer membrane protein, like a little marrow protein, which of course has been one of the first proteins to be crystallized, membrane proteins. It actually, the situation is actually quite complicated if you think about the normal environment. OPS lipids and so forth. And so one of the advantages that NMR in principle can offer is that we can work with these kind of preparations. So we can in principle leave the protein in the lab environment. In this case, it would be for example would be the outer membrane protein, like the little enzyme, Park L that we started a couple of years ago. And that's basically what we started to develop a couple of years in Utrecht. So we have here this protein, and you see NMR spectra of reconstituted liposomes which are also something that, of course, are somewhat challenging for some of the refraction methods. And then we have here the bacterial cell envelope and then the whole cell. And the resolution is not so good here, but maybe you can believe me that we can still pick up the protein of interest with these kind of experiments and, and biochemical approaches that we do to look at that in detail. And so we published this already a couple of years ago. And then more recently, we got more ambitious and looked at the core secretion complex. Put very strong to this one. Yes. So here we're talking about a, uh, this is actually an image from Gabriel Rexman here from the UK who worked on a type 4 secretion system in the bacterial cell envelope. And this is actually a cartoon representation of the complex that has been uh, studied by a single molecule at cryo echo microscopy, but uh, actually be embedded in the cell envelope of bacteria. So you see here the core complex that has been uh, very beautifully visualized by Gabriel. But the idea is that actually that protein must be somehow inserted into the inner membrane of the bacteria. And so we use actually NMR technologies to, to, to actually probe the structure of this complex by specific labeling and technologies basically that allow us to look at these kind of complicated systems. And as you probably immediately realize, if you're a little bit familiar with NMR, that doesn't only mean spectroscopy, sensitivity, and resolution, but it also means biochemical approaches to actually see that protein of interest. And one very simple way is to, for example, realize that uh, in bacteria, the, the most abundant proteins are on A and on F in the outer membrane. And if you just use a cell line where this protein is deleted, then of course you have much better opportunities to, to see the protein of interest. We also did this uh, uh, by using actually antibiotics. So you can actually play a little trick where you actually only induce labeling of the protein by adding this kind of antibiotic at the right moment, and then the spectra will be dominated by the frozen of interest, but you still have an endogenous kind of environment around this in a mass cell. And um, more recently, uh, that's actually a collaboration that we have been going on for a while, so I had a PhD postdoc that came from an EM lab in, the, in Canada, Lindsay Baker, she came to our lab to learn NMR like we do these days in our lab, and now she's back in Oxford, 
uh, with Kai Grunewald, or she's still here, she couldn't come here today, but she's doing cryo of course, and tomography. And when she was in my lab, she studied a program called YETC, which is an inner membrane machine, basically, that it helps and facilitates insertion of proteins in the inner membrane. Uh, it's basically the leaf that is not only can do by itself, as you can see in this little graph, but also via the second YG system. And um, of course, the crystal structure of this uh, protein has been solved by a Japanese group a couple of years ago, uh, which is actually quite remarkable because it has a lot of water premises when you look at the structure itself. So that, that's kind of peculiar. But what we did together with, uh, what Lindsay did together with uh, the, uh, the Oxford group here was to actually compare now the samples that we would use for NMR to cryo-electrotomography. So what you see here is again our preparations that we do to be able to see this protein in the cell envelope. And then they then did the conventional kind of uh, graphene-based uh, electron tomography analysis via these kind of biochemical tricks that we use. And then you see immediately that the length and width of these uh, equivalent bacteria are as we expect, also in terms of morphology, no, uh, no change after also after our NMR experiments. And then she could also nicely show that actually the cell envelope that we are interested in, where the protein is, is located in, of course, is also nicely visible. So these are all prior electron tomography images. Of course, I'm not an expert, so the experts I'm sure are here. <laughs> uh, but what you can nicely see is that we see indeed the cell envelope, so the white line here is basically the inner membrane, then the ketoblacken layer and the other part. And 95% of all the samples, these are nicely intact, even after our measurements. And so we can really assume that this protein is. is in the right natural environment. And then what you really can say is that you can actually use the same preparations to get uh, back to what NMR is very good at. And that is to say, if you can record a spectrum, for example, what the people would call HSBC, so in green you see actually the sample in this kind of same state. In black is the same spectrum now, uh, reconstituted from this protein, liposomes that we also can see. You can imagine now the, the potential that this study could have because you could see now each, each little dot here is actually one atom of this machine in the natural environment. And uh, that's something I think would be in the future very useful and we want to continue on these lines in the future to combine tomography and NMR in these kind of preparations. And maybe another example in this direction where we are not that far in terms of uh, natural environment is uh, again a very nice system in the cell envelope, and this is actually now from the outer membrane, the so-called bound complex, which inserts outer membrane proteins uh, via this machine. Actually, basically, the second stage, set YHG, basically translocates this protein of interest, and then there are chaperones, the leaves, sir, A, and skip, which probably escort the protein that you want to insert into this complex, and then finally insert it. Now, this has been actually quite a total force for structural biology, and you may know that uh, Susan Buchanan from the United States has been working on this, and she actually solved a number of crystal structures of the components of this system. And she published last year a very nice review that shows a little bit uh, the state of the field right now. So these are actually two crystal structures of particle complex and detergents. This is a cryogenic structure, for example, where Sheena Redmond was involved in, uh, in the UK. And what you see is you can resolve many but not all subdomains of the whole complex and you also see that there's a lot of structural variation uh, that, that is uh, present in these structures uh, published in the last few years. So the question is what, what actually happens to this complex and so then in the spirit of what I mentioned to you before we have been actually looking at this complex in biomes and uh, with NMR technology sensitivity and the labeling that I mentioned we can actually uh, go quite far in a complex which has been you know, almost prohibitive in terms of size, but we actually managed to get, for example, information of the core unit. This is this uh, better barrel bar A system that you see here, about uh, I think 500 amino acids, and also the other units. So we actually formed that complex in liposomes and then check what happens to this core unit by NMR standards, and all these little dots actually, at the red policy actually uh, show protein uh, segments which actually are mobile, so they're dynamic. And in this kind of insertion process, there's one uh, field of belief that says probably when the, the substrate comes in here, it has to be folded by the uh, chaperone bomb itself. And it could be that actually this folding of a beta barrel actually uh, occurs by augmenting beta strands via these kind of templates. And so the dynamics that we see here could be very well you know, facilitated in this. And interestingly, that if we actually form the complex and liposomes, uh, this dynamics goes away so that the complex is stabilized and at the same time we see an opening here in the center of the uh, bilayer and that's a very much in co uh, 
in agreement with Dr. Susan and other groups that are studying crystallography, uh, indicative that this opening is really happening also in liposomes. So that's, uh, that's uh, one aspect that you can do then. And then again, coming back to the question, can we use this for cell preparation? So we also have made preparations that we have already constituted the liposomes, but we can also either a full complex or part of the complex look into the cell envelope again, so going back to these bacterial graphs. And the first study that was just uh, appeared in structural biology actually was to ask the question, what actually happens to this uh, subprotein C? Because again, there is a lot of view confusion. Is that protein actually here, or could it be actually on the other side of the membrane in the, in, the, in the cell? Because there's some evidence that antibodies actually recognize C on the other side of the membrane, which is kind of puzzling if you look at the crystal structure. And so what we could show is by these data is that actually this little C component here only gets stabilized when A is <coughs> around. So that's the first indication that maybe to really understand how this complex is formed, so you have to look at the entire protein. So from that we so, so far only know that C by itself is not uh, highly stabilized and needs A to be around. It has to be forward. Now, then another example I wanted to show you was more on plasma membranes. So we go now to mammalian uh, receptors. And there we started, of course, being an MRP with something that expressed as well. So we took a, a human skin cancer cell line, A431, that is very rich in, in uh, EGFR, which is a classic receptor. The tyrus and kinase family, so we have high expression. When you take an Alexa diet for EGF, you see you know, lots of protein. And they are interesting because, again, they are a hallmark of structural biology <coughs> in the sense that there are many uh, structures are known for the domains of these receptors. In total, there are four of that family. And it's also known, for example, that EGF actually binds in this region in, in the crystal structures. But it's also clear that this, this little transmembrane helix is a little bit peculiar, right? Because you have to not only accommodate these kind of structures in some kind of way, and this is the transmembrane region, this is a uh, kinase domain, so activation that is. That is <laughs> but if you think about the activation process, then uh, this is uh, taken from a research uh, now, then you would have to think that if you base it on the crystal structures which are out there, that actually this receptor somehow is a, what people call a tether conformation that has been seen in crystallography before the addition of EGF. So EGF is actually a little more, uh, red, uh, orange type ball. And then after activation or binding, then the EGF would somehow raise or rise, so to say, from the membrane and then form these dimers that again have been seen in crystallography. And so, yeah, so this is uh, the current mechanism or the mechanism that people have proposed. And what's also interesting is if you actually overlay the domains here, so these are the extracellular domains, you actually see that the structures are very similar between these two states. And the, the major structure changes are the huge or even arrangement of this uh, <coughs> entire complex uh, after activation. Now we ask the questions, maybe we can use, again, technologies to look at these cell preparations and compare this to what we see in, a, in this case, plasma membrane vesicles. So we took our cells and then we used procedures that have been developed in the cell biology in the 80s and 90s to make what I call membrane vesicles. And these vesicles have the advantage that if you do a mass spec analysis of these cells, you see that the, the relative point concentration, which is probably very high to start with from the, from the cancer cells, is even more increased for EGFR. That's, of course, the protein of interest one. So I'm sure you cannot read this, but this is actually the bar for EGFR, which by far becomes uh, the most uh, dominant protein. And so then these kind of preps are, in principle, amenable to NMR, and what we call the high-sensitivity NMR that, that we have access to in track. But you could also think about cryo-UM or microscopy. And that's, again, you know, in the spirit of the session, that's what we did, so we took whole cells, but also these vesicles uh, to really probe and confirm that all these little dots are actually active EGFR receptors that, that bind, in this case, an antibody that selects for this receptor. So, and actually these, uh, I should say that these vesicles also show phosphorylation, so they're also functional, so we are happy to uh, report that this is also something that is for functional relevance. And then we can do NMR experiments, not the kind of things we might be used to from textbooks, but still, you know, we can, you know, these days we can measure spectra, in this case, so called solid state, double quantum spectra, and then we can track on the basis of the structural model that has been around, based on crystal structures, we can actually compare before and after addition of EGF what happens to this uh, system. And to make long story short, what we can clearly see are strong changes in the threonine region, serine region, and in particular in the so-called beta strand uh, regions. And these beta strands must come 
if any of this structure is relevant for our preparations, it must come from the extracellular manual. So in other words, the signals increase after addition of EGF at higher temperature, relatively high temperatures. And so what that means for an MR person like us is that actually the, before the addition of EGF, the chimeras domain is relatively rigid, so it's probably attached to the membrane. There's evidence to confirm on this. And once we bind EGF, the extracellular membrane becomes stabilized. Less dynamic, as NMR people would say. So that was interesting. So we see the data would support the idea that the extracellular membrane is dynamic before binding. And then we also ask the questions can we actually zoom in on specific regions? And so that's what we did. Is so we can make the very expression uh, conditions where we actually just supply a couple of amino acids. And so because we know the sequence, we know structural information from in vitro, we can actually zoom in, for example, on the EGF binding site and this labeling. And so we can directly basically probe what happens on these kind of different ranges of the receptor, for example, the C-terminus, which is also elusive we, uh, we are currently studying. And if we do that then, again, then we use what we call high sensitivity NMR, and we can basically then really go to the, down to the level of sequentials and the atomic resolution information of the residues, we can check what happens at the uh, EGF. And lo and behold, what we find is actually that really the site that we think is coming from the binding site also exhibits chemical shift changes, which is indicative of something happening in terms of structure. So when you put all of this together, you can basically make all a cartoon representation. And this is also for, for crystallography. But what NMI in this case gives us that uh, uh, this kinase domain seems to be rigid before activation by EGF. And we see our data would be, uh, explained, would be best explained by significant motion on this domain. And then once EGF binds, you stabilize something that could be looking like these kind of conformations in crystals. But of course, we have not the, at this point the information to, to confirm this. And maybe what I can say is that you can also see this for another family of this receptor HER2. So it seems like in our case, um, that is a general phenomenon, and then we can of course think about maybe adding uh, drugs or biologicals to actually see how they change these kind of information states. The last thing I want to show you is some ongoing work in, in cytoskeleton proteins, and again, this is a hallmark of the success of crystallography and uh, cry uh, as you all know, so microtubules have been the subject of, of many of us for, for many years. <coughs> you might not know, but actually NMR has also played a role in this. So uh, colleagues of us in the United States, they were looking at actually uh, polymer production by microtubules and then did actually binding studies by NMR, in this case also NMR, of uh, minus plus and binding protein. Uh, Cap Gly, so uh, the Jennifer Lenova and company that worked on this. And earlier we were actually looking at already almost you know, 10 years ago now at the small molecules that are interesting for pharmacological applications, the Hoslon B, which is a little bit like Taxol, but it's a little bit of a different kind of formulation. And we could show already 10 years ago in a paper together with Novartis that we get an idea how the structural binding of this drug actually happens on microtubules. Now, of course, these days, thanks to Eva Nogales and many others, we have beautiful structures with high resolution. But still, there are cases where I think uh, maybe the, the joint technologies are useful. So this is a project that came to us from actually from a local cell biology group, Anna Kanova. She's a really an expert in, uh, in this. And these are proteins called Kamsa proteins that bind to the minus M of microtubules. And they specifically bind to this. And um, what you can do is you can actually, uh, because of course the first thing people wanted to do is cry OEM. That makes a lot of sense. But then you want to populate as much as you can. And so Anna and uh, Kelly Morris from, from London that worked on this from Primary M actually could show that just a single point mutation, you can actually populate the entire microtool. So you now have a protein that is similar to the cup lice or whatever you like, and it basically has you know, a nice binding to the entire microtubules. And sure enough, the cryo data that beautifully showed how this domain, which is called CKK, actually is located on the microtubule structures. Uh, this is actually a structure that was sold by NMR in the Rickon lab a long time ago, and we in our place we also did some experiments with the free peptide. But then it turned out, uh, at least for Carolyn at this point, that the resolution of the, of the maps was, you know, could be improved, I guess. So this is, you know, I'm not acquiring them again again, so I'm not gonna <laughs> say anything more about this, but this was what we had basically a year ago. So here you see nicely comes up the current place in the tubular region and here you see location. Mm -hmm. But now we ask the question, maybe we can use the NMR, which is so sensitive to local changes, to, 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 to 
confirm or to, to support this. And so what we did experiments is actually then to just compare the MAR data of CKK before and after addition to the microtubules. And then at MAR, of course, then you use um, something like a titration, and then you see chemical shift changes, and the chemical shift changes should be biggest when it's actually bound to the microtubules. And so if you plot this, so the chemical shift changes between free and bound, CKK, okay, almost like this. You can nicely confirm this is model, so you see that the mass shifts are beautifully uh, matching with the quiet and that are indicative that the structure is correct. And uh, more recently, we now have also been able to actually make microtubules from mm. HALA cells for NMR purposes. So we managed to get the functional uh, uh, microtubules, which are actually NMR labeled. So we have the NMR signals from the tails, which are Boston slash modified, as you probably know, actually in HALA cells they are not so much modified, this is what our NMR data gives. But you can also now actually probe the structural parts or the tubulins that we see in these polymers by NMR. And it actually turns out, I mean we're working on this right now as we speak, so to say, that the structures from EM are actually fitting better to our data, which is a nice confirmation that actually the crystal structures of the tubulin are a little bit different from microsteinmates, the best ones to my knowledge. A little bit different from what you see in the quiet and you know, we're trying to reconcile that. And then the question that I have for Tassos and maybe other experts is that we also see evidence for post session modifications in the protein, not only in the tail, but also in the protein. And we've been looking at this for the next last couple of days on the PDBs and we couldn't find any. And so maybe this, at the coffee table we can discuss what they could mean or not mean. And with that, I'd like to close. So the work in Utrecht is done in my group uh, by a couple of PhD students. So John is, for example, working on microtubules, and uh, Rainier is working on the uh, cancer cells. And the first part is, uh, for example, work with Cecilia. She is graduating very soon uh, on, on the bump complex, for example. But we also do this together with, uh, with uh, cell biology people like Anna Gmanova, already mentioned, Jan Thomas, and also cell biology groups in Utrecht. But as I mentioned at the beginning, we're also very happy to collaborate with other users, and we have done this, and we can give more information on this with external users that want to make use of this kind of technologies in the future. Thank you for your patience.